Now, NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio with Lee Whitting. Whether you're listening on TalkZone, my podcast, through the archives of our ad-free shows on our YouTube channel, or connected through the incredible content of our Facebook page. The following reports are a series of spiritually transformative experiences recently provided as a monthly service to members of IANS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. Reports like this are one great benefit of becoming a member of IANS. This selection was taken from accounts submitted by experiencers and are provided here anonymously. IANS is grateful to those who have sent them accounts of their experiences. The first one is a first-person Canadian Catholic child's account of her drowning. She finds the experience quite enjoyable. She sees Mary and Joseph, and Mary smiles at her, and the child remembers how important she herself is. But it took the experiencer 50 more years for her to learn about NDEs. The experiencer writes, We lived in Toronto, Ontario, and on this summer day, I went to the local swimming pool near our townhouse with my father and sister. I was three, and my sister was six. We were playing in the pool for a while when my father said we needed to get out for 15 minutes for an adult-only swim. I wasn't very happy about that because I wanted to stay in the water and didn't understand why the adults couldn't swim with us still in there. So my sister went and sat on our towels by the deep, and well, Uh, While my dad went for a swim with the other adults, I I stood looking into into the water near where my sister was sitting and thought about jumping in so that I'd sink straight to the bottom. And when my feet touched, I could push myself straight back up and pull myself out and no one would even even notice. I wasn't sure if that would work or not, but before I could give it any more thought, I jumped into the water. The second I hit the water, I heard my sister start yelling for my dad, which was a good thing because things didn't go as planned. I started spinning and spinning and couldn't touch anything but water. I noticed that I was running out of air, and for a second I thought, "Uh uh-oh. And then I was on the bottom of the pool, kind of came to, I guess, and I felt wonderful. I was so relieved that the spinning had stopped. I got up and kicked something off my feet, and the I seem to be able to swim now. I figured I'd better go up to the top and pull myself out since that was my original plan. I could see my sister standing by the side of the pool looking at something on the ground, and my dad and others were there. No one was looking at me, so I figured they must have seen that I could swim now and was okay in the water, and they were busy with something else. I guessed it must be fine for me to stay in the water, so I started to swim around again. But I remembered the look on my sister's face. She looked horrified. I was curious about what they were all looking at and decided to swim back up to sea. While I was on my way up, there was suddenly a swirl of colors in the water that turned into people. It seemed very odd, but I started watching this and never ended up going back up to see what my sister was looking at. I knew the people looked familiar. I had seen them before in nativity scenes at Christmas, except... Now they were alive and life-sized. It was dark around them all, even though it was a a, a sunny uh, summer day. But not pitch black dark. It was dark like when the lights are off in your house in the middle of the day. I focused mainly on Mary, who was wearing a dark blue robe and a lighter veil, but also noticed a man, Joseph, I assume, in a brown robe holding a staff. There was a manger, but I didn't notice it if there was a baby in it, and I don't know if there were more people or animals there. Mary and Joseph were staring straight down, and I just looked at them and was totally confused about what they were doing under the water. Then it got very bright around them, and all they looked and they all looked up. Mary smiled at me, and she was so beautiful. What happened next all seemed to take place in one second. It's as if Mary's face moved and I could see in behind her eyes, and it was a very bright light, but I recognized the light and said in my head, Ah, it's you. I knew her and was so happy to see her. I felt so much love and 
remembered that I was so important. I just wanted to go to her and started moving towards her, but then suddenly I was pulled or sucked up out of the water and was sitting on the side of the pool. I felt so disappointed. I wanted nothing more than to go to her. I didn't know who pulled me out of the water. There was no one behind me, and my dad was standing by the fence and was very, very angry and lecturing me, which was so out of character for him. My sister was staring at me angrily with her hands on her hips while my dad was telling me how selfish I was. Everything looked so hazy compared to the crisp, bright light, bright people I had just been look, looking at under the water. It looked like my dad had big tears in his eyes, but I thought maybe it's just from being in the water. I felt so confused. Why was my dad mad at me for being in the water when a minute ago he didn't seem to care that I was there while he was busy with something else? When he was done scolding me, he walked away. I looked at my sister, who was still angry, but then her face softened, and she said, were you scared? I looked around to make sure my dad wasn't near, and I shook my head no and said, it was fun. Then she yelled at me and said I'd better not ever do that again. I got down on my knees near the pool and looked for the people in the water. I had no idea where they went. I didn't understand what had just happened. My dad came back and got upset that I was so close to the water again and said it was time to go home. While we walked home, he seemed to be back to his normal, fun dad self again, and I was so relieved. But when we walked in the house, he went straight to my mom and said that he thought he had lost me. He sounded so upset again. I really felt like he was making a much bigger deal out of it than it really was. Later, my mom told me that I really upset him and I better not do anything like that again. A few days later, we went to my uncle's for dinner and my aunt started asking me questions. She showed me pictures of statues of Jesus and asked if I had seen him that day and I said no. She asked me to point at who I saw, so I pointed at a nativity scene, and she said, Oh, baby Jesus, you saw baby Jesus. Then she looked at my mom and dad and, and said, So she died. I, I didn't understand why just because she thought I saw baby Jesus meant that I had died. As far as I knew, I was very much alive the whole time. No one ever questioned me about that day again. Over the years, I would think about specific parts of it that baffled me. What was under the water that I had to kick off my feet? I eventually told myself that it must have been a towel that fell into the water. That's the only thing that made sense. Why did my dad leave me in the water for a while, then get mad at me for being there? That didn't make sense. My dad hardly ever got upset, and this was the worst I'd ever seen him. I didn't understand that part until years later. Why did I see people under the water, and why did it feel so good? As I got older, I thought that must have that I must have hallucinated it, and maybe the lack of oxygen is what made me feel good. I didn't understand why I would hallucinate a Christmas nativity scene in the middle of summer. I decided that some of it would probably never make sense. In 2004, my dad had surgery to remove a tumor from the side of his face. The operation was supposed to take about three hours, but the tumor was more difficult to remove than they thought, and it took hours longer. His heart stopped for a while during the surgery, but they were able to get it started again. And when we went to see him afterwards, he said that during the surgery, he was up on the ceiling watching the doctors operate, and he saw his face cut open, and it was gross. Sadly, I told him that it must have been a dream because that was the only thing that made sense. Also, my dad had gone blind a few years prior to that. He passed away a month later and never came home from the hospital. In the summer of 2021, my sister and I were talking about that day at the pool, and I said there that I must have been really groggy when I got pulled out of the water. She was shocked by, by, she was shocked, uh, by me saying that. She said, you weren't breathing. You needed to be resuscitated. That made no sense at all to me. And months later, I stumbled across NDEs on YouTube, and it wasn't until I watched quite a few of them that I realized what actually had happened that day, why I was suddenly able to swim, if I was actually swimming. I had kicked my body off my feet, not a towel. 
When I came to on the bottom of the pool, I never had to go up for air. When I thought I had been pulled out of the water, I was actually sucked back into my body, which is why there was no one around me. My dad did have tears in his eyes because he thought he'd lost me. And no one could see me in the water because it was my spirit of, or consciousness that was in there having a great time while my body was being resuscitated. It took 53 years before it all made sense, including realizing that my dad really was on the ceiling watching his own surgery. In my mind now, death is not scary because we don't really die. It's going to be amazing. And there, her account is ended. <clears throat> In this next account, a woman shares a near-death experience when her organs are nearly shutting down. After leaving her body and viewing circumstances in her hospital room, she travels to alternate realities, including another planet. She is given the message that life is a series of experiences and perspectives, and that nothing is a mistake. The experiencer writes, In 2015, I was in a coma on ECMO, life support. I was given last rites, and my family was told to let me go, as doctors said, they had done all they could. A prayer blanket was laid on me after my head was shaved and my brain was scanned for activity. The prognosis was, if I lived, I would probably be in a vegetative state, but that living probably would not happen as I had less than 1% chance of living. My CO2 level was over 200, normal is 20 to 30. This was almost completely CO2 in my lungs and the brain has no oxygen to survive. My blood was poisoning me. September 26, 2015 was one of my weekends to die. Family and friends came in from all over the world to continue prayers, but realistically to say goodbye. More than once they were called. My daughter kept telling everyone I would live, which was treated as a faithful delusion. I dimensionally traveled, saw life and the world from other perspectives, and my senses have been heightened. I did not have the typical near-death experience. I'm pretty logical, scientific, and I am always asked about the whys of things more, more so before my NDE. I did not talk about the details much of, about what I experienced because it was an astronomically different experience and it took me a while to process. I also tried a bit too much at times to analyze certain things I experienced because it was hard even for me to believe, even though I think I am a fairly open person to a degree. I was intimidated about sharing details with traditionally-minded friends and family, as I had some traditional views as well, though not all traditional, so I wanted to make sure I had thoroughly analyzed my experience. Now I feel ridiculous about my lack of freedom of expression about it. I realized this was part of the control I had to let go of. It wasn't until I read a PMH Atwater's book, We Live Forever, and saw a documentary on Netflix about NDEs called Surviving Death, that I realized my experience wasn't odd. I left my body and saw the room I was in when I was being prepped for something and heard the doctors and the residents' conversation about how I wasn't going to make it. I tried reprimanding them and talking to them about their comments, but they couldn't hear me. <clears throat> I traveled to space and to alternate timelines and dimensions. I did a lot of traveling. I did not see my body when I went into outer space. I just saw from a first-person perspective. I traveled to another planet and saw a different alien species. I did see my body there. It was deformed like a person with a disabling disease. I heard from my guide, whose voice I heard, but I couldn't see who it was from, that I was deformed there because it wasn't my planet or my species. I also heard that life is a series of experiences and perspectives, and that nothing is a mistake. I was placed in a lily and saw from a first-hand viewpoint the plant's perspective as though I was the plant. I was placed in a fish tank as a fish and saw the viewpoint of the fish, yet could not see my own body in these transitions, but had awareness of myself. 
I had a lot of questions about things going on behind the scenes in this world. I was shown some things going on in, in the world that are not much as much in the news, but based on things that I questioned about the world's issues. For example, kids and women that are disappearing, etc. It was it was like I was shown the back room of the issues of the world that I had questioned and it made me feel like the world was an awful place that I did not want any part of, and did not want to idolize. You had to be there to understand what I mean, and that is my attempt at a joke about it. When I came back to this place, I used humor as a coping mechanism, but also as a buffer to my heightened emotions to try to minimize the intensity of my experience. When I came back, I was so over the world and felt like everyone was ridiculous and too serious about everything. I had seen the Earth's culture's back room, got my questions answered, and was not a fan. I think one of my guides manifested as my daughter to keep me anchored to the world, or I may not have come back. I had no concept of time, but everything seemed to happen all at once like there was no time, and I could not tell if things were fast or slow. It's hard to explain that part because my mind is acclimated to time and order. I received messages, prophetic images, and also received answers about my life and how I related to the world. I predicted Trump would win, though I did not know he was running while in a coma. I only found out once I awoke. Uh, I'm not a Trump fan, for your information. I predicted the study of trees having consciousness. Kim Jong-un in North Korea settled down and tried to be a more friendly nation before erupting again and a major alien contact event coming, by my estimation, uh, in 2023. Those are just a few of the things I saw. Trees are conscious and are actually an intelligent species. They know our true world history and have survived many cultures being born and dying off. We just take them for granted because we don't look at plants as intelligent life forms. We can learn a lot from them, and they take care of us in several ways. Experiments are going to start to be done on them to prove their consciousness, and the goal of those exper experiments will be to extract information. I hope these experiments will be made public information, but you know how those things go in the world. Either way, we will hear about it. I saw a light brighter than I have ever seen. The closest comparable light on Earth is from the sun, but the non-traditional shocking part to me now, not then, is that I instinctively put my hand out and a silver sphere appeared. From it arose out a, a hologram of the typical image of Jesus Christ. I held it in my hand while this light emanated. I felt at peace and had no particular feeling like surprise or curiosity. It was just like I just was. There was a voice that beckoned that the experience was over and I was going back even though I didn't have any concept that I had left because it was so sudden. Then the light all of a sudden pulled back, and that was it. I think this was the time my vitals improved overnight by 50% because I was switched to an oscillator instead of a ventilator. After that, I believe I was partially conscious because I remember certain things that were obviously loopy states with awareness of my surroundings. I believe I was shown an image of Jesus because, as a formerly traditional, now non-traditional Christian, I believed in him and admired him as a historic figure, comforter, truth-teller, etc., and believed in his existence and mission from a soul perspective, and not so much as a traditional religious perspective. On the other side, people come forward as comfort and support, but they aren't necessarily in the image of their actual souls. For example, your grandmother who died may not still look like how she left you, but if you are dying, she may manifest in the image you are used to to bring you comfort, ease, and familiarity through your transition. I now believe that everyone who has had an NDE has different experiences because, based on what I learned, we are all interconnected but experiencing different ways and forms of life according to what we came here to learn this time around. 
KPMH Outwater's book and the Netflix documentary helped me to understand that there are others who don't see the typical tunnel, angels in robes and grassy fields. There are some of us who are space and dimension travelers, and that is normal too. And here her account ends. This next account was submitted by a 71-year-old woman who remembers vividly a time at age 16 when she was desperate to find out if God exists. She even dreamed of walking around every night looking for God until she was taken into a white light experience. It changed her life and gave her a new purpose. The Experiencer writes, You will seek and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Jeremiah 29, 13. My mother told me when I was young that I didn't have to worry about whether there was a God or not because there were 10 proofs that God existed, and I'd learn about these when I was older. I went to Catholic high school in Milwaukee. We discussed those 10 proofs in class when I was 16. I was disappointed since none of the proofs proved anything to me. Knowing if a God existed was important because that knowledge would help me determine how I should live my life. At first, I thought about God and thought about God, but I couldn't convince myself that there was one. I didn't have a problem understanding concepts in school, but I, I couldn't intellectualize the, the existence of God or life after death, for that matter. So I started my search to find God. I began to search for God day and night. I searched each night in my dreams. I would dream that I was walking through rolling hills and rivers at a land with a temperature climate. There were no people or animals there. I just kept walking through the ground looking for God. The next night, I started walking again, right from where I'd left off. After months of this recurring dream, I started to see animals, sheep, goats, and rabbits. Then I began to see people tending to those animals. The people in my dreams all looked similar. They, they had even features, straight, light brown hair, a relatively small build, and wore white tunics. In my dreams, I looked like one of them. When I walked by a person, I would ask them where I could find God. Initially, these people ignored me. I kept walking each night and asking everyone I met, where can I find God? One night, one of them said, don't you know? Then he ignored me. Then another would say, don't you know? Each morning I woke up eager to continue looking for God the next night. Finally, after about six months of recurring dreams, I asked a man I came upon, where is God? He said, don't you know, it all flows. Then he touched my arm and my arm flowed into his arm. Startled, I woke up. The next night, I met the same man. I was careful not to touch him. I asked him, where can I find God? He said, you'll find God tomorrow. I was elated. I woke up looking forward to the next night. So the next night came. I started walking joyfully from where I'd left off the night before, anticipating finding God. But when I came upon someone, they ignored me. I was trying to understand why everyone ignored me since they had spoken to me before. I kept walking and walking anyway, but my alarm clock went off. It was morning, and I hadn't found God. I was upset. I thought there must not be a God, since I've looked and looked and still can't find him. I even lie to myself in my dreams. At that thought, I fell into deep despair felt like I was spiraling down into an emotional abyss. When I hit rock bottom and experienced total despair, I felt a presence come into my room. This presence personified completely compassion and love. I heard the entity say, Find peace, my child. You've suffered enough. Simultaneously, it felt like a giant arm came down from heaven and scooped up my soul. A white light suddenly engulfed my spirit. Inside the light, I felt love, total peace, and acceptance. While inside the light, I knew everything. There were no mysteries. At that moment, I felt absolute love. Then suddenly, I was put back on the edge of my bed. 
I thought, wow, there is a God, and he loves me. Until that point, I'd felt ambiguous about life. I thought there couldn't be a God. I didn't know what to believe. What you get from life is essential if there isn't a God. What you give during your life is critical if there is a God. Before this experience, I would think, what's in it for me? After this experience, I would think about what's right and wrong. Knowing if God existed was vital because that knowledge would frame how I lived my life. Now I knew he existed. After that, it didn't matter if my family loved me. It didn't matter if anyone loved me. For that matter, and I wasn't afraid to die. And if I died, I'd go back into the white light. I thought, I came from the white light, and someday I'll return to the white light. Everything was known when I was in the light, but I didn't know anything again once I was back in my bedroom. I didn't know anything. I didn't know if all people go to heaven or only the good ones and what it is to be good. Does good mean you follow the Ten Commandments? Which is the true religion? Are all faiths right or, or none of them right? Should you love everyone? And what does love mean? Should you have sex before marriage or not? I decided I'd only uh, have sex with someone I loved, preferably after we were married. Now that I was out of the light, I was ignorant again. I did know that life had a plan, and I knew life would unfold as it should. This knowledge gave me the strength to endure setbacks in the future. It made me more accepting, and it gave me a sense of peace. This spiritual experience was the most profound moment of my life. I can't convey what happened in words. Before this experience, I didn't know what to do with my life, but now I knew I wanted to do positive things. Previously, I'd put in as little effort as possible to get what I wanted, but now I've begun working very hard to achieve positive outcomes. I'm 71 now. Back in 1967, people didn't talk about white lights, so becoming encapsulated in one was a complete surprise. I was expecting to find God in my dreams more in line with uh, the teachings of the Catholic Church. I thought if I walked through the promised land in my dreams enough, I would eventually come to some pearly gates. Behind them would be the kingdom of God with a big castle. In the court, I'd meet God sitting on a big throne, and he'd have Jesus sitting on his right side. I was called a heretic by the nuns at school for not believing in God. I didn't tell anyone about my experience for a long time. If I told anyone God came to me in a white light of love, they'd think I was lying or suggest I see a psychiatrist immediately. I did tell my boyfriend, Peter, about my white light experience 42 years ago, and he married me anyway. I also told my mother. She said, that's nice, dear. Then I told my sister, and she said, I'm glad you had that experience. Neither one of them got that something profound had happened to me. I thought no one would ever understand this, so I kept it to myself after that. Although I spoke of my experience infrequently, it motivated me to do what I thought was good and gave me the strength to endure whatever I needed to survive. I read that 200,000 people are brought back after being clinically dead each year in the United States, and 10 to 20% report having a near-death experience. Although these experiences vary, most say they went into a white light described as love and peace, similar to what happened to me. So I'm not alone in having an experience like this. The most significant difference is that I wasn't dead when it occurred. Most people who have a near-death experience no longer have a fear of dying. I don't fear death either. As I get older, I'm looking forward to it. Since I was so young when it happened, the experience shaped my life. And here her account ends. This last example of an NDE is where the experiencer didn't remember it, but others were able to attest to him having done so. He reports what others told him about it, and it seems to explain his miraculous healing. The experiencer writes, I am a 60-year-old combat veteran of the Vietnam War from North Carolina. My story begins when I visited a friend in Virginia Beach, Virginia. 
My friend is a 70-ish year old Christian lady who happens to have what is commonly referred to as psychic abilities. To those who would argue that a person couldn't be Christian and psychic at the same time, I beg to differ. But I report my truthful experiences with her herein. Suffice it to say that my friend can see and or intuit things that most ordinary people cannot. I've known her since 1974, and she's been a good friend over these many years. She's a very goodly and God-revering woman who studies the scripture and prays to our Lord daily. When I visited her this time, she advised me, you have lung cancer and you're going to die. Because she's always been so accurate in the past, I took this advice seriously and immediately reported to the Veterans Affairs Medical Center and asked for a physical examination. I'll never forget when the nurse on duty asked me if I'd ever had an Agent Orange exam, and when I replied that I had not, she scheduled me for one. The AO physical examination affirmed my friend's prognosis, and I was subsequently referred. Physicians performed exploratory surgical testing and advised me that my cancer was in stage 3B and incurable. They told me, go home and get your affairs in order because you're going to die and there's nothing that anyone can do about it. Not wanting to accept this dire prognosis, I boarded a plane and went for a second opinion. The physicians told me that the doctors had lied to me about the stage of my cancer. My cancer was actually in stage 3A. Now there's a big difference in the staging because the National Cancer Institute advises that a stage 3A cancer patient may be a candidate for surgery, while a stage 3B is not el eligible for surgery. However, the physicians advised me that otherwise their physician's prognosis was pretty much the same, and that in any event, I was probably going to die. Fortunately, another friend who happened to be a social worker called and told me that, she, that he had been in touch with some oncologist physicians and that they had expressed being uh, amenable to seeing me despite lack of medical insurance. I boarded the next flight home, where the fine medical personnel examined me. The oncologists and social workers found a clinical trial that I qualified for, and they offered me treatment paid via the auspices of Medicaid. Together with 11 others who, sh who shared the same stage of cancer, I entered a clinical trial. Long story short is that I had a remarkable reaction to the chemotherapy as it all but eliminated the 5.5 centimeter malignant tumor, which had been growing in my left lung. And while the chemo didn't totally and completely eliminate the cancer, it did eliminate enough of it that the surgeons came to me one day and said they would be willing to perform surgery in an attempt and with the hope of saving my life. Initially visualizing that he would only have to take but half of my left lung, once he went in there, the head surgeon realized that he would have to take the whole lung, which he did. All went well, and I seemed to be healing up. Then about a month later, the doctors discovered that I had developed a fistula, and they would have to go back in and repair it. A fistula is a hole in the bronchial tube where the bronchial tube has been severed in the removal of my lung. The good doctor said that he had to advise me that fistulas are the number one cause of post-surgical mortality following a, a pneumonectomy. So a month after my undergoing my first uh, pneumonectomy, I had to have another one. This time, however, I died on the operating table. And this is where my beautiful, albeit incredible and miraculous story really begins. Lying on the operating table, I awoke following the second surgery. When I opened my eyes and looked across the operating room, the first thing I noticed was that the entire surgical team, which consisted of about <clears throat> seven physicians, surgeons, was grouped together in a football-like huddle on the far side of the operating room. Listening intently, I could hear one of them talking, and the more I listened, I realized that they were praying for me. Then, all of a sudden, one of my prayerful surgical team members looked and looked, turned and looked directly at me. Apparently, he'd noticed that my eyes were, were wide open, and 
were looking back at him because the next thing I remember is that he was excitedly shouting out loud, he's alive. And with that, they all broke huddle and came rushing back over to my bedside. They were all very busily checking their medical instruments and at the same time telling me how surprised they were to see me alive because I had died. And that they had tried everything they could think of to revive me, all to no avail. Finally, abandoning their attempts to revive me, they decided to gather together across the room and pray for my soul. Now, back at my bedside, and for about the next 20 to 30 minutes, they systematically went about checking every machine, reading, and doing whatever doctors do with a patient who is in recovery. Eventually, one by one, they all wandered off to their other chores. All but one, that is. This one physician stayed by my bedside and eventually looked down at me and said, You're probably wondering why I'm still standing here. To which I replied, You want to tell me some more about my dying? To which he replied, No, that's not the reason why. So I asked him, Well, uh, <clears throat> what's up, Doc? He said, I've been performing these same surgical procedures for the past 20-something years, and Something happened here today that I've never experienced before. It's had such a profound effect on me that I feel that I have to tell you about it. So I said, okay, go ahead. He started, we had you wide open and were removing some special kind of fat tissue from your heart to use to tie up your fistula when all of a sudden you started talking out loud. Surprised, we all jumped back from the table as we initially thought that you had perhaps come out from underneath the anesthesia. But when we checked our instruments, we found that, no, you, you were still under, still unconscious. So we just stood there and listened while you talked. So I said, uh, well, uh, what did I say? I had no recall of anything that had happened while, I, while this was going on. He replied, it's not so much what you said, it's, it was to whom you were talking. So I said, uh, well, uh, who, who was I talking to? He said, you were talking to Jesus. And when he said this, I just didn't know what to say. I thought, gee, that's not very funny. Why would this doctor say something like that to me? Looking deeply into his eyes, I could tell that he wasn't joking. He was quite serious. He looked somewhat shaken up. So I said quietly, well, was he talking back to me? Or was I just hollering out into the void? He said, we couldn't hear any other voices, but it sounded like you were engaged in a two-way conversation. Then he added, by the way, I'm going to make sure that this gets into your medical records. With that, I thanked him, and he went on his way. About 10 days later, I was mended up enough to be released from the hospital, and I went home. I had all but forgotten about this event until about a month later when I traveled back to Virginia to visit my psychic spiritual friend. When she entered the room, she froze on the spot and stared at me with a look of total astonishment and incredulity. She said, you're all lit up. You've got lights protruding out from all around and over you. You have angels flying all around your head. She crossed the room sideways, never taking her eyes off me. She had a look of absolute astonishment on her face. She eventually made it to her desk and sat down, still intently staring at me. Without saying anything else, just staring, she began to cry. Tears began streaming down her face. I didn't quite know what to think about all this, but her behaviors began to affect me. Then very quietly, she said to me, you know that you died last month on the operating table. I said, yes, the doctors told me that I did. Then she really rocked my world, saying, well, did they tell you that you had a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus himself? I almost fainted. Instead, I managed to reply, yes, they did, but they couldn't tell me what he had to say. Do you know what he had to say? She said, yes, I have the whole thing. To which I replied, well, you've certainly got my attention. What did he say? She replied, I'm going to tell you what he said, but first I need to tell you something else. I said, okay, go ahead. She said, when you came to see me last year and I told you that you had cancer and that you were going to die, that was it. That was your life expectancy. You're not supposed to be here right now. 
I just wanted you to know that. Now I'll tell you what happened, what he said, and why you're still here. I said, please do. She said, when you died and you left your body, you screamed out at the top of your voice that you were sorry if you had ever hurt anybody in any way while you were on earth. You screamed it out so loud and with so much emotion and conviction that you startled everybody that was around you at the time. Jesus just happened to be over there, and he came over to where you were to see what all the commotion was about. She said, you jumped in front of Jesus and started talking your head off. You didn't really know who he was, but you just started telling him that you had just gotten out of prison and you were undergoing treatment for cancer and that you were now getting a big government VA disability check for exposure to Agent Orange in Vietnam every month and that you would never have to go back to work again and that you weren't ready to die, that you wanted to go back and have some fun. You got them all laughing. It was then that Jesus reached over and touched you and instantaneously cured you of your cancer and sent you back to your body. You're now going to live for another 26 years. Do you want to know what you're going to do for the next 26 years? I naturally said, yes, tell me. She said, you're going to spend the rest of your life helping others who have had experiences similar to those you've had. You want to know why you're going to be doing that? I again said, yes, why? She said, because that's all you really want to do is to help others. Isn't that wonderful? She had stopped crying and was now smiling. She said, you're going to tell a lot of people about what happened to you, but very few are going to believe you. But I believe you because I've seen and heard it with my own eyes and ears. I've been giving these readings to people for the past 40 years, and you are the only person that I've ever seen other than myself, who has ever had a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus. Since then, three years later, my cancer metastasized to my neck, and this elevated my case to stage four lung cancer. Once again, I attempted to get the needed medical help for my service-connected disease, and once again, I've been refused help. Instead, they refused to offer me surgery because there was simply no chance for a cure. So once again, faced with the prospect of dying because of not being treated, I had no alternative other than to return to the fine folks elsewhere and receive the necessary surgery, yet again administered via Medicaid. Immediately following the surgery, however, my surgeon came to me to advise me that he had been unable to remove all the cancer and that there was still some cancer cells left in my body. Remembering what my psychic friend had told me three years earlier about my living for another 26 years, I simply smiled at the good doctor and thanked him for doing his best. And when I had another CT scan a couple of months later, I was cancer-free. Not believing their eyes, the doctors have advised me to have CT scans every 90 days since then. I've now experienced another NDE-like experience. Four years after my last surgery, I had a heart attack. My mother called an ambulance and I was rushed to the hospital. I wasn't getting arterial oxygen and was placed on a BiPAP machine. My bodily functions, heart rate, vitals, etc., were being watched as I was hooked up to a myriad of monitors. The lights to my hospital room were off, but my do door was slightly cracked open. I'd been reading a book entitled A Search for God and I decided to close my eyes and pray. When I shut my eyes, I noticed a small pinpoint of light behind my closed eyelids and decided to focus on it as I prayed. And as I began to recite the Lord's Prayer, the light began to grow bigger and get brighter. It grew and grew and became brighter and brighter and brighter until my whole head was filled with the light. It had begun as a small little speck, but grew so large and bright that I couldn't look at it anymore. It hurt. It was too bright. It was incredibly bright. I opened my eyes and noticed that I was out of breath. I was breathing very hard, like I'd been running and was out of breath. I was incredulous, very excited about what, would, what I'd just gone through. A doctor or male nurse stuck his head in my room, and I excitedly began to tell him about the light. 
He then noticed that my BiPAP machine had come off and was lying beside my bed. He asked me how long the BiPAP had been off, and I said, Never mind the BiPAP. You've got to hear about this light. I want to tell you about the light. That's all I could think about. He said that he would hear about the light later, but needed to know how long the BiPAP machine had been off. When I told him that I didn't really know, he turned on the lights and called in the other staff, the nurses, the doctors. None knew anything about how long the BiPAP had been off, but they noticed that all of my vitals on the computer monitors that I was hooked up to seemed to be in the normal range. In other words, I was breathing normally and getting all the oxygen that a normal person would be getting. In short, I didn't need the BiPAP machine anymore. In closing, I felt like I'd been in the presence of God and that I was again instantaneously healed. The nurses told me when I was discharging that they'd had a bet going on as to whether I'd live or not when I first came to their ward. While I don't think that this can be considered uh, an NDE, or, or at least not like the one in which I actually did die, I was certainly close to death. Before being discharged, I was taken into surgery and given a heart stent. They told me that one of my arteries was blocked and that, and that was the reason for my heart attack. In any event, both of my experiences happened in hospitals, and both can be verified. I'm writing these memoirs feeling fine and thanking the Lord every day that I'm alive. After my heart attack, I returned to school and obtained a Master's of Social Work in hopes of helping others. My cancer-fighting experiences definitely changed my life. While the above stories aren't the only instances in which I've noticed the divine influence in my life, they are undoubtedly the most dramatic. As a footnote, I would like to note that of the original 12 participants that were initially entered into those clinical trials, I'm the only one that's still alive today. My life today isn't anything like it was before I started having these NDE experiences. I tell someone every day of my experience with Jesus and how he touched me and cured my cancer. I especially like telling my story to other cancer patients as my story seems to impart a sense of hope and faith in those facing death. I like to think that my story gives solace and comfort to others who are told, you have cancer and you're going to die and there isn't anything that anybody can do about it. And here his story ends. My thanks to IONS for all they do, including their extensive collection of NDE reports. If you haven't yet attended one of their annual conferences, I'd recommend this year's being held in Virginia just outside Washington, D.C. Check out the IONS website for details. I hope to see you there. And thanks to you for listening. If you'd like to hear this show again or any of our more than 500 archived ad-free NDE interviews, go to TalkZone's NDE radio site and hit the Past Shows button, or go to our YouTube channel, NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, where you can subscribe to and comment on the complete NDE radio library. And be sure to check out our NDE Radio Facebook page. Just search NDE Radio with Lee Whitting on your Facebook app. And listen again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern at Talk Zone for more NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting, saying thanks for listening.